Welcome in to another episode of Level Agency's Test, Learn, Grow podcast. I'm Dale Reether, Digital Marketing Lead here at Level. I'll be your host for today alongside Level Agency's fearless leader and CEO, Mr. Patrick Patterson. Pat, thanks for joining me today. Super excited to have you. Love it. In this episode, we're super excited to welcome Joshua Berry onto the podcast. Joshua is the co-founder and managing director of a consulting group called Econic, which focuses on innovation, leadership, and organizational culture. He is also the author of a book called Dare to be Naive, which is which will start hitting the shelves on November 28th. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Uh, again, very excited to be talking to Joshua today about his book. Myself and all the employees at Level had the opportunity to listen to him speak at our 2023 agency summit over the summer. And it was really inspiring. Uh, it was definitely one of my favorite sessions of the day. So I'm super excited to get to talk to you about that and dig a little bit deeper. So with that, I'd like to welcome in, in Joshua. How's it going? Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for taking the time to join us today. I really appreciate it. Absolutely, Dale. Uh, thank you and Patrick for having me back. Uh, I don't know if there's a jacket for like return guests to the Tesla uh, <laughs> podcast, but uh, I'll check my mail afterwards. Uh, it's exciting to be back. This was one of my favorite uh, podcasts, uh, the one we did it earlier this spring, and just excited to continue the conversation. Awesome. I'm glad to be and excited to be a part of this one. I wasn't able to join the last conversation, but I'm here today and I'm super excited about it. Pat, how you doing, man? Thanks for thanks for joining us. I know uh, that you're excited for this conversation as well. You know, there was a, I heard that we were we were recording a podcast with one of my favorite humans and I had to be here. Uh, Joshua is amazing. Uh, he and I have gotten to know each other over the past three years now, Joshua. Uh, and uh you know, what he's doing, I think is really important. And I'm really excited to, to jump in and, and talk through it. Awesome. Yeah. It's been great. Uh, Patrick and I uh, first met, um, and four years ago now, uh, when I was speaking at the lean startup conference and Patrick and was there learning. One of the things I learned about you early on is that every year you had a topic or a theme and thinking about how you can continue to bring that back to your team and culture. It's been fun to watch level and all the growth that you all have had through that. So I'd love to start things off today. We, you know, we're focusing on your book. It's launching soon. That's got to be super exciting for you. I know it's been just based off your, your talk over the summer that I listened to that this has been in the works for quite a while. You got to be super excited, man. How does it feel that the moment is finally here? <laughs> Dale, it is, it is. It is beyond words, and now I'll use words to explain it. Uh, I, just last Wednesday, I finally got to hold the hardcover versions in my hand. There was a pallet of of my batch of books that were delivered uh, on the driveway that met me when I got back from, from some travels. Uh, we had 7,500 of these books printed, and 500 of them were sitting there uh, ready for me to sign for the people who have been part of the early pre-order campaign. And so, yes, I have so excited. I have hardcover versions. Uh, you all at Level got to have some advanced reader copies. Look at that! Advanced reader copies that we got to print out. As you said, because it's been such a journey and there have been a number of, of time and schedule delays that we've had to work with. So I am very excited that it is finally here. That's awesome. I'm super excited for you. And I'm really excited to dig a little bit further into the book today. I'd love to um, just talk a little bit about, can you tell the audience, and I got to hear some of this at the summit and so did Pat and the rest of our team, a little bit about your personal journey. Like what led you to ultimately taking the leap to write this book and what inspired you uh, to write about this topic? Yeah, you know, part of my personal and professional journey uh, begins with kind of something that's the opposite of being naive. And that's relying on myself to always try to be the smartest person in the room. And uh, that was, you know, through through excelling in school and college and everything after a pretty difficult childhood. And uh, eventually getting to a spot where I could start to be more comfortable with myself and my not knowing. I, I don't know. It's one of those things that as you continue to get older, it seems you realize how much you don't know. And yet... You almost always have to feel like you got to keep up that mask or that guy like you do. And you don't want to admit that you're, you're primarily just making it up as you're going. And so this book journey, I would say, really probably kicked off about 10 years ago when I uh, officially went out on my own after a successful career uh, working for an international human resources consulting group. 
and uh, going out on my own and going into the first startups that didn't work and uh, realizing that I had to start to unlearn some of my thoughts and my processes and, and, and getting more curious and, and being able to set my ego aside and, and understand, you know, again, that I don't understand everything. And so uh, the book, uh, Dare to be Naive, How to Find Your True Self in a Noisy World, is truly that experience and that, that, that approach uh, to hopefully help other people also get to a spot where they can say, you know what, I've got something inside of me. What, what is that true self? And with all this noise and everything that's going on out there, how can I let the most authentic, innate part of me come out? Uh, and specifically, how might that come out in a way to better serve the world of business? Because uh, there's a number of things about work uh, that, that are kind of broken, don't work the best way they can. And I believe that we truly can make a better future of work and a better future for how businesses interact with all parts of society. Yeah. So in chapter one, you talk a little bit about the original definition of naive, uh, yeah. which I found super fascinating. And then, you know, I think in any, in, in, you just talked about this, but like naive, naivete in general has been something we don't, we didn't want to admit as leaders, right? You can't, uh, is like the swear word naive, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and we all have to put these masks up and this armor up that, that prevents people from seeing that. So how, you know, what advice do you give leaders, you know, based on this and based on your, now your, your deep understanding of what it means and how important it is to embrace that? Yeah. You know, as, as you hit upon it, uh, naive is kind of a bad word. And especially, you know, when, when you're younger and you're first getting into the, the job place. Uh, you want to be seen as someone who knows. You want to be seen as accepted. And there's a lot of reasons why we've evolved in a way to to desire that. And yet, uh, to your point, leaders who embrace more of a curiosity, who embrace more of an authenticity or a genuineness, which are truly uh, the the real definition of of naivete, uh, are those leaders who I continue to see further and further excel and do things that are different and for the better, right? And so the advice that I give a lot of those leaders is to first start with just a reflection on, um, okay, you, you, you have an idea or maybe let's say you're in a meeting, okay, you're in a meeting and 10 people spout ideas and you have a thought that bubbles up inside of you to say like, no, actually, I believe something different to kind of respect that voice that's coming up inside of you, right? Because uh, a lot of times we will keep ourselves quiet and we will screen ourselves to only share what is accepted within the mainstream. And uh, when we can create space to kind of be more authentic and lean into those things, and, and a lot of times that means being curious and admitting that you don't know or we may not know or there might be something else left to learn, um, it opens up a whole nother level of impact for those leaders who are willing to honestly be brave enough to be able to admit some of those things. Yeah, I mean, how do you... How do you do that though, right? Uh, you know, that's the that's the hard question. Uh, and man, if you let let's answer that, right? So, like, how do you still lead uh -huh. in 2023, 2024? How do you still be the the one that people look to when there's problems, and the one that uh, you know is is setting the vision and the three to five year strategy and all the things that yeah. we're supposed to be as leaders, and then hold that in your mind while also being able to say, don't know. Yeah. Right? That's scary. Yeah. I, I, I believe that we were taught and I was taught very early on that the best leaders were those who had a bold vision and could convince everybody to come along and follow them. Right. And I think there's still some truth to that. I think, I think people want to see a better future and they want to see uh, a bold vision of how things could be different. And, and there is part of that, that, that is part of being naive, right? If, if you, if you see and survey everything around you and you're optimistic and even a little bit idealistic about where things could go, that's, that's a part of being, naive. but I think, uh, what people appreciate even more in an organization or a team or family or whatever it might be is truth and authenticity and 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 people don't want to be lied to they, they don't want to if you truly don't know they don't want you to pretend like you do know right 
uh, maybe a better response to give something concrete is, is, you know, if somebody, if they're worried and, and like, where, what do we do, Patrick? Like, where do we go with this? Being able to say, I don't know. I'm a little bit scared too. What do you think we should do? I have some ideas as well, right? Like you invite people into the same feeling versus what we've set up for so long in businesses is this like us and them and, and the hierarchy that again, can sometimes work, but more and more as the pace of change continues to accelerate, we actually need to create environments that are more about sensing and responding and learning and, and really creating and collaborating together. And that takes a certain level of, I don't know, which also takes back to your question about what you need to work on, takes a little bit of inner work to understand what is it that's inside of me that's saying, I need to come across as someone who does know all the answers. And I know I personally had to do a lot of that work uh, on um, ego, still do to this day. To be the smartest person in the room on this thing, I want to be the one who knows. I want to hold all those things. And yet, like I, th I think people appreciate much more of the authenticity. That really resonates with me. And I can speak from the perspective of someone who I'm 10 years into my career. I think of myself as a leader, but more you know, in that middle management tier. I'm not on the executive team. I'm not a CEO. And... As I've been trying to, as I've been stretching myself and trying to step outside of my comfort zone and grow, there is a, a need to feel like you need to know everything or else you're coming off as uncredible. And I promise I'm not trying to play teacher's pet here with you, Pat, but being able to see you and Patrick Van Gorder have that level of auth authenticity and say, hey, we don't know sometimes. Like that gives me the confidence to be like, it's okay not to know um, and to be able to take a best guess as long as it's calculated. Um, and that, I think that just le alleviates so much pressure with the people that you are leading and allows them to be them, their best self. So I just wanted to chime in and say that really resonates with me as one of the people that you are leading in the, in the agency, Patrick. So um, I think that's super important and, uh, and that really resonated with me today and whenever you talked about it at the summit. Yeah, it's interesting, Dale, as, as you talk about where trust comes from. Uh, there was a book, at least probably 15 years ago, called The Speed of Trust by Stephen M. R. Covey. And, and there's this image of a tree, either he or someone afterwards uh, put in there. But it basically had, like, the roots are integrity and then intent and uh, capabilities and results, uh, I believe, were, were what the four were. And... Just pretending like you have the capabilities to be able to do something, but you actually don't, like completely undermines the roots of that tree about integrity and intent. And so uh, you can go a long ways and you can have a very sturdy tree, even if the leaves are blowing off, the results aren't there, even if the capabilities need to change all the time of knowing, if you have truly shown up in a way that demonstrates your integrity and demonstrates your intent, which back to what we said before of like the, I don't know. I also want to figure this out. Here's what I'd like to do. What do you want to do? That goes a lot further than pretending like you do know, and then uh, you're found out or you didn't, and then you've completely like undercut those those roots. So, Joshua, I've had the the pleasure of knowing you uh, for a while, and I've seen your journey as well as you've been writing this book, uh, which has been exciting. And how has this research and really just the process? of sitting down and writing it down. How has it changed you personally? And what have you, how have you evolved throughout this? I mean, you, you said you didn't start 10 years ago like this. You talk about some really personal stories where, uh, you know, you, you were slapped upside the head by some mentors or, or, you know, uh, you know, had some epiphanies throughout the book. So, you know, how has this process of, of sitting down and really thinking through this one topic changed you personally? Good question. Yeah, I did not sit down to write this specific book. I sat down to write a book that uh, probably would have been a shadow of uh, firms of endearment or conscious capitalism or, or the healing organization, which I think are all Raj Sisodia books. So you can tell I'm a, a Raj fan. Uh, and yet, uh, as I started out writing that and doing the interviews and doing the research, I kind of kept bumping up against this idea that, you know, the core, a core message of the book is using business for good. And that 
the world probably didn't need another case study driven book on using business for good. That, that wasn't the thing that was truly shifting a lot of people in that way. Instead, what I found in the research was after talking to a number of leaders, they kept using the phrase, you know, this might sound naive, but, and then shared some amazing idea or belief or whatever it might be. And, and what I started to think was, why do we keep using the shield of, of, it might be naive, like to, to protect some great idea or belief, right. That's put out there. And to your point, it made me even reflect on myself about how often I would use things to be able to shield some of my truest, best, what maybe not best, but <laughs> truest ideas so that my authentic voice that I wanted to share out there with the world. And what would truly happen if I did put that out there and share it with the world, right? Uh, my version of this might sound naive is I used to, I used to uh, give other people credit for an idea just to like test float it by people. Like I would say, hey, rather than like outright claiming an idea or an, or an opinion, I'd say like, I heard, I heard Patrick say one time that da, 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 and then I would share some great idea, almost like using it as a shield in case people didn't like it. How that's relevant to my personal journey and all of this is putting my thoughts into writing was really scary. Because what I had to do is I had to admit, these are some of the things I think or believe and potentially be there. In fact, almost all the time be there when somebody is consuming those without me there to defend them or explain them away and still is admittedly a little bit scary. And yet, uh, this has been such a growth journey for me to be able to say, if, if it truly is like how to find my true self in, in this noisy world, well, then how do I, how do I put that out there for people, whether they like it or not? And, and what sorts of ripples of impact can come from that? If I'm truly trying to come from a place of good intention and belief and put some ideas that are out there. And so I had to do a lot of these cycles of, of putting ideas out there and testing it and learning that it wasn't as scary. And, and even when I did receive really critical feedback on early drafts, realized that like, I was still okay, right? Like <laughs> it hurt, uh, but it was okay. And so nah, there was a lot of a lot of growth that happened through that journey. You just mentioned the term ripples of impact, which I know is something that is consistent throughout the book. Do you want to talk about that concept and really what that means a little bit? Yeah, uh, there there's a couple faculty members from the Modern Elder Academy, uh, which is co-founded by Chip Conley, who first came up with this term. So it's not mine. Uh, ripples of impact it was seen as a new ROI. And the concept really intrigued me. In fact, it was an, an early draft of the manuscript had it as as the title or the subtitle, one of those two, because because it catches it's kind of catchy, right? That in life uh, we can pursue, especially in business, two types of 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 ROI, right? The, a traditional return on investment and ripples of impact. And yet, the one that speaks most to me is that idea of thinking about the impact that I can make in my choices or in my decisions and how those can ripple out to other people well beyond even what I am likely aware of. And there is plenty of evidence in, in some of the research in the book and also well covered in other people's books that organizations that do choose to uh, think about a broader impact of their work typically do have a greater return on investment from their time and their talent. And so, so there is a, a connection or a linking between those. My book is not out there to try to add to the great compendium of other books that are already like ROI gives you or ripples of impact gives you ROI. But mine does explore deeper the idea of what are ripples of impact. Uh, another name that I use in the book is virtuous cycles, right? How do we take small actions uh, that lead other people to challenge their beliefs that lead other people to different actions? I think a better world comes from people who are willing to be naive and overly optimistic or idealistic, because if we believe in those ripples of impact, uh, it, it actually takes people to do that. You know, the example I like to use is, is at the Starbucks line, right? The, the, the person who buys coffee and then the next person buys their coffee and, and that paying it forward sorts of things. There's always a catalyst that has to happen in some of that. Or, or a friend last week was telling me that uh, they had just visited Ho Chi Minh City and the intersections literally scared the crap out of them, right? Because because you'd come up and it'd be six lanes of cars and vehicles and everything, and nobody's paying attention to the the traffic intersection lights, and so just 
cars and scooters and everything are flying by. And it takes like one brave person to keep nudging their car out there a little bit into the flow of traffic. Uh, and then all of a sudden people stop and, and everybody is able to now flow and, and go that way, right? Like ripples of impact is really about this belief that if all of us are just waiting back, and, you know, specifically, if everybody's just thinking everything is cynical and, and, and our best days are behind us, well, we're, we're likely going to perpetuate that, right? And yet uh, those people who lean into leading with trust or leading with good or kindness or any of those things are truly the ones who will also hopefully perpetuate that. And um, yeah, that's and, and that's truly kind of what we mean by our ripples of impact. I love this idea of ripples of impact. It doesn't necessarily mean it's positive, right? It could be negative ripples as well, right? You talk about virtuous cycles. It could be a vicious cycle yeah. um, that has ripples of impact that are negative across the, you know, the organization, the world. So how does, you know, your concept of, you know, daring to be naive help us influence a more positive ripple, ripple of impact, whether it be that intersection or whether it be our organization or our role yeah. or our family? Yeah. I, I'll, I'll give a, a concrete example within, within our organization. Several years ago, my co-founder and I uh, were about to hire the person who was going to, you know, be... be be the person who's going to make the most amount of money and, and be the, the most senior consultant that we were going to bring on. And it was a big leap of faith to go into this. She joined our team. It was exactly as we had hoped. It was wonderful. And within about seven months of joining our team, uh, I heard from her that she had just gotten an opportunity to go interview for a dream job in a dream location uh, to move to London. One of our core principles at Econic is employee growth over company growth, which for a lot of people sounds really, really, really naive, right? Because obviously we need to keep growing so we can give employees opportunity. Or we like to say, yes, employee first up until a certain point. But we've always said, no, I, I need to have an even over here. Employee growth is important. Company growth is important. Employee growth even over company growth at, at Econic. And so uh, when Nicole approached us and said, hey, I've got this opportunity, one, we already had a trusting enough relationship that she was able to share that with me. And we were able to start to brainstorm and think through what this could be. Fast forward, uh, she gets invited over to Europe, is able to uh, do interviews there. She calls me that week and it wasn't, uh, hey, I've got this offer and it begins a negotiation or anything. We were collaborating on, oh, are, are they going to include moving costs? Like, what do you think with this? Oh, could this work for you, et cetera? She ended up taking the job, moving there. We lost lost a great person and we couldn't have been happier for it. Now, here's the interesting things, right? Like eventually, uh, Nicole was the referrer to someone who eventually was our director of operations for five years. Uh, she was the person who led us to our, our marketing leader for a couple of years. She became a great friend in a number of other ways. And the Monday after Thanksgiving this year, Nicole's actually coming back to our team after her five years uh, leading a division at Spotify. And we're excited because we're going to be working in 2024 to build a new program to help more leaders awaken to their innate abilities and ideas. I share all of that to say, like back in 2017, 18, when all that was happening, there wasn't any part of me that's saying like, oh, I got to do this because someday in five years, she's going to come or the referrals are going to come or any of those sorts of things. It just innately felt like the right thing to do. And, and it's something that you had mentioned earlier, Dale, I think is, I'm not also saying like completely throw reason out the door, right? I think it's about what is reasonably and intuitively correct, right? We, 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 we I helped, we had conversations, but we didn't say like, you know what? And also here's, here's six months worth of salary. Good luck. And we'll pay for your moving cut. Like we, we didn't go like, but we did what felt reasonably, but also what felt intuitively correct because we believed, loved her and wanted to share and give. And it's amazing then the ripples of impact that come from that. Yeah. I think that's, you know, we have, um, we have an award that we give out twice a year. It's a peer nominated award, a Prouty award, uh, for our values, uh, and, um, you know, at one point we were putting all of our past winners up on our website and there was one of the employees that no longer worked here. Mm -hmm. And the response I got was, well, do we want to include her on the website? I was like, absolutely. I'm so proud 
that she was able to find this next role for herself, uh, even if it's not at level. Uh, and if we were a small part of that journey for her, uh, that's really, really exciting. Like we should, that should be celebrated. I, you know, I think there, there's probably a bit of naivete in that, right? And like people may, might go to that website and ask the question, why isn't this person working there anymore? And oh my God, what does that mean for the Proudy Award winners and blah, blah, blah. But like at the end of the day, like I love this idea in business in general of, you know, just being really generous with those types of conversations, those types of situations that you're in where it's, hey, what can I do to help you? And I, I forget what I was watching uh, a couple months ago where, you know, a, a CEO was talking about someone comes to them and they're like, hey, I'm looking for another job. And that CEO says, hey, I'll, let me do everything I can to help you get that other job. <laughs> right. Whatever. And the, the only time he looks at it as a failure is when they come to him and say, I got another job hmm. and I didn't talk to you at all. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and, and I think like, that's not, that's not how businesses were run 30, 40 years ago. And, you know, you, you get advice from mentors and leaders and boards and other CEOs that are like, you can't do it that way. Uh, and, you know, I don't know if it's naivete or, or, or if it's just, you want to be a good person, but like, I think in general, reacting to those situations with generosity for humans is going to create that positive impact. So, you know, I, I, I love that story. I think if we can do more of that as businesses and understand that, you know, we are here to help each other, whether that's helping each other at the company level, the personal level or whatever it is. And then what can I do to help you? Because at the end of the day, that's, we, we have very little time to impact folks. And so let's just do as much as we can to impact folks in the most positive way. And that might mean that this isn't the right spot for you right now. And that's okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and I, and maybe I, I approach that with some naivete because I think that's a really important, you know, foundational leadership tactic. Yeah. I, I appreciate those examples. It's, it's, it's just a resetting of what game are you playing <laughs> in all of this. And there's one definition of, of being naive, which is you're unsophisticated and, and unsophisticated. Uh, the root of that is, is soft wisdom, right? That, that you're lacking wisdom. And this is where I think it's completely wrong because what are you defining as wisdom? If, if what you're saying is this construct that I've created called Econic, which is completely made up at a very, you know, atomic level, uh, is the box that I'm playing in. And I don't realize that that's the box I'm playing in or the paradigm that I've created for myself. Well, that doesn't feel very wise to me, right? Being able to actually appreciate that we are interconnected in a way that I, that goes beyond any rational belief that I, or understanding that I have is, is a different set, right? And, and of, 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 ways of practicing and looking at things, right? And that's why I mentioned before, it takes some inner work. You really do have to continually progress in saying, how am I acting? And what are the beliefs that underlie that action? And how are they serving me now? And how are they limiting me right now? And as I continue to grow, are there new beliefs that I need to start to understand or appreciate? And, and the more I keep digging into it, and the more I keep working on it, you know, the, the, the paradigms continue to keep shifting around what game it is that we're actually playing here. And when I start to understand that at a deeper level, uh, I'm able to act out of a more generous way, as you were saying. You started to go down this path a little bit, I think. And this is what something I really took away from your talk at the summit. And I know is a recurring kind of framework that you bring up in the book, but I loved the, where did I learn this? Is it true? How is it serving me? And what do I lose by continuing to believe this? You want to talk about that a little bit more in depth? Because I thought that was really freaking cool. Like that really, <laughs> that really hit home for me. And I'd love to hear you just like talk through that a little bit more. Like so many great things in life. Uh, it came from a podcast. Uh, several years ago, I was listening to a podcast that introduced me to these four questions. And it, once I heard them, it kind of resonated and I'll repeat them again in a moment, but 
it took me a little bit of digging to try to figure out where they came from and the body of work that was truly like whose shoulders I'm standing on here. And uh, the person uh, to whom they're most attributed to, or at least a variant of them, is, is uh, Byron Katie. And what I really did was take some of that body of work and, from what I can tell, apply it for the first time into the business setting to really say, how do I look at the limiting beliefs that are getting in the way of, of whatever I'm doing next in my organization or my leadership? And so it's, it's, a, it's a riff on some of those questions. So full credit to, to Byron Katie for the initial inspiration for this. It starts with the idea that our actions oftentimes are built upon beliefs, right? We're acting out of some belief, oftentimes subconsciously. And those beliefs, if you follow it all the way down, all those turtles, uh, they, they probably come from assumptions that come from some perceptions of reality that come from actual fact that's under there somewhere. And so the questions really come at it with a almost a logical approach to thinking about your beliefs. And so uh, let's say, you know, I'm, I want to start working out more and uh, I tell myself that I don't have enough time. Okay, that's a belief that is now underlying this action of not working out. I don't have enough time, or, or maybe even a deeper one. I, I don't have enough time because uh, it'd be selfish to take that time away from spending it with my kids. The four questions are really to help someone say, great, let's take that belief, that, l- that belief that uh, has probably served you for a while, but you, you're sensing attention. You're saying you want to do something different and, and reflect on the questions where did you learn that belief? Where did, where, where did you learn your belief? You don't have the time and that it's, you might, it's selfish to take that time away from your kids. The second question, is it really true? And to wrestle with that question a little bit, because, uh, it's, it's sometimes that, that tells you like, okay, where's the, where's the evidence underneath of this? And sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't almost always it's partially true. And then the next two questions are extremely powerful. What do I gain by holding this belief? And then what do I lose by holding this belief? And depending upon if it's a negative or positive belief, uh, one of these questions will be easier than the other. And you've probably thought through it. But the, the example I just gave, what do I lose by holding this belief? It's sometimes easier to be able to say, oh, what, what do I lose by saying I don't have enough time and it's selfish to take it away from my kids? You know, I, I lose working out, of course, or, or I lose uh, being able to actually... Um, maybe even demonstrate a good example for my kids of, of prioritizing self-care. What do I gain from holding this belief? And then this is, this is curious because I think, and especially on this one, you don't think about it very often. There's likely something I gain by holding the belief. I don't have enough time. It's selfish to take it away from my kids. I might gain comfort. I might, I might gain, um, I might gain a sense of pride or maybe it's an ego stroke of like, look how generous I am and martyring I am for my kids, right? There's, I don't know what your beliefs are around any of that, but just the sheer fact of being able to step back and reflect and try to objectively think about those things has been proven to significantly influence your next actions and your next beliefs. And so, um, yeah, those, those four questions have really resonated with people. In the book itself, the, the whole second half of the book is structured in a way to actually provide uh, almost like parables or anecdotes and research or stories of different types of work practices, but it's not meant to like tell people and now go do this thing, right? <laughs> One of the chapters is on side hustles and permitting side hustles in your business. The chapter is not actually about advocating, <laughs> please hear this people, go let your people do side hustles. The chapter uses that intentionally to poke at you to be able to then get you to the end of the chapter and say, cool, now what do you believe? Do you believe you could trust people uh, to use their time wisely? Do you believe that it's our right to let people have? Like, what is it that you believe? And now where did that come from? Is it true? What do you gain? What do you lose from that belief? Because I think what we need is more leaders who just wake up and are more conscious and more intentional about the way their thoughts and beliefs are impacting the actions that they are doing in the workplace. Great. In your in your journey here, um, you know, every t- every now and again, I read a book and or I write down an idea, and it goes into this category of I wish I would have known it 15 years ago. If I could travel back in time, here's the one sheet I would hand little Pat, uh, like, hey, learn this stuff. Um, 
what have you learned through this process? What have you changed about yourself? You talked a little bit about, you know, the, the, the journey of even writing the book, but what would you go back and tell, and there's got, there's a bunch of Joshua's out there, uh, that are, that are starting their journey. that are starting their leadership. that are starting their families, starting businesses, whatever it is when they're 22, 23, what do you go back and tell Joshua at 22 and 23, um, that you think would make those positive ripples of impact throughout the rest of your life uh, and the and and what you've done. The first one, back to a younger Joshua, would be to not be scared to own what you think and what you feel, and being able to put that out there in a way that was authentic, and and realizing that it wasn't as scary, right? And so I I, I think I would have tried to get to that achievement uh, a little bit earlier on. A second thing would be around contentment. I still struggle with this, not as much, I think, as I used to, but I very much was a hyper-achieving person. That's If you take the saboteur test, that's my number one, is hyper-achievement. There's yeah. always something else to be achieved, always something else that will make me happy or content. And being able to show to a younger version of me how that hedonic treadmill works uh, I think it's something that I would go back. Something specifically though in the last few years that relates to the writing of the book that I wish I would have told myself several years ago and probably would have had this book come out earlier uh, was who are you writing this book for? Uh, for the longest time I used the excuses of like the, the world doesn't need any more books right in case in point like the shelf I'm looking at here. <laughs> The world doesn't need any more books. And in fact, even during the writing program that I used to help keep accountability and keep me going on writing, one of our exercises was to go to the library and pull down a bunch of books in your genre and study their chapter structure and other things. And I was convinced even more thoroughly after that field <laughs> trip, like the world does not need another business or leadership book. But there was uh, something in one of uh, Seth Godin's books, uh, The Practice. Uh, that specifically called out, like, you're not writing a book for everybody. You are writing a book for the hundred people who are going to hear the same message that's been rippling throughout history differently because it came from you, because of all the other stuff around you. And when I, that was a complete shift of perspective uh, because it conflicts with the sec the penultimate thing I said, which was this contentment, there's always something better or higher achievement. Like, I am always saying, oh, this should be better. It could be bigger, whatever it might be. It made it come back to craft something worth sharing. Craft something for those people around you who love and care about you and probably already know your name. Do that and do that well and with quality and then see what happens from there. And uh, that was that is absolutely something that I would share with a younger version of myself. I love that. You know, I think that's really... I mean, it's a really powerful lesson. When you read a book, it's not just who you know. It's also that moment in time that you're reading it, right? Or when you get information, it's that moment in time that you're hearing it. And you may have heard the exact same thing 170 times, but you weren't ready to hear it yet. There you go. Uh, and thinking that you're only writing the book for the people that are ready to hear it uh, can probably mean like, well, no, just go read Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. You're fine, right? Uh, or, or go read Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. I don't need to, I don't need to write anything about that. They, how can I be better than that? I'm not probably right. Yeah. Um, and it's about, you know, packaging it and understanding that like someone's going to read that at that point and, you know, it's going to be different for them based on their experience up to that point. And they might need it at that moment. Right. And I think like personally, there's a lot of times where I'm like, I think of something cool or I see something cool and I'm like, well, if I read it, then everyone else read it. So I don't need to share it. Right. Um, and then someone else shares it on Twitter or whatever, and it gets a million reshares. And I'm like, doesn't everyone already know that? Uh, and so, but it's this idea of like hitting the target at the right time and packaging it, uh, for, for those that are ready to, to receive it. Um, and I think that's a really valuable, like break down the barrier. Even, even as you kind of said there, like putting it out there and the people who are ready to receive it will receive it. Um, 
versus trying to time the target or time any of those things. Like I, I find the more I try to hold on to and, and, and machinate things like the less I'm able to great example. So this book was actually supposed to come out in the springtime. Um, and anybody who's listening to this and was part of the pre-order campaign in 2022, thank you for your patience. The book was supposed to come out in the spring due to some, um, relationship things I was having with my previous publisher. I ended up pulling the manuscript and, uh, shopping it around and bringing it to a new publisher who was excited to work with us. One of the reasons why I wanted to do it is I was excited and being told that I should make a run at the Wall Street Journal bestsellers list. And uh, we had sold a few thousand pre-order copies. We were seeing there was actually something that was probably going to be within reach. And so without that catalyst of saying, hey, you should do this, I probably wouldn't have gone through those extra steps of readjusting and rethinking about what I want with the book and going to a new publisher. It also gave me the time, though, to work through why am I doing this? Do I really want to do this, et cetera? What's actually important to me on all of this? We ultimately decided several months ago with the new publisher that we weren't going to pursue the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. Because when I actually sat down with myself for a little bit, learning about all of the gamesmanship that needed to happen to make a list like that, didn't feel like it aligned with my with my values. Uh, at least the approach that I could do. There are plenty of people who make lists like that because they're way more famous and have more followers <laughs> than I do. But for someone like me to be able to get to it, we would have had to use uh, some of the approaches to you know get books for instance, um, ordered in a bunch of bookstores around the United States to ensure that there was the proper representation to make a list like that. We said, nope, authentically, innately, we're not going to pursue that. We're, we don't want to do it. Fast forward to book launches in two weeks. Less than two weeks ago, the Wall Street Journal has stopped doing a bestseller list um, because of some of the things that I had just mentioned there. The reflecting, the sitting back and just thinking about like, who would know how all these things would play out? trying to time things, trying to do it all. Very rarely do things not work out when I pause and I create the space to actually think head, heart, and like gut and body, like what feels right here and what feels reasonably and intuitively correct. And you know what, let's go for that sort of thing. And then sometimes <laughs> they cancel the bestsellers list and you're like, like, how does this stuff happen? How does this synchronicity line up in life? The story I told earlier about Nicole coming back to the team. I came out of other turmoil and things that we were doing and during the summer being like, you know, I think, I think this book is really telling us that we just need to create more spaces for leaders to come together to work through their next transition of life. My next follow up, I, I talked to Nicole twice a year. I started to share this with her and she said, you know what? I've been thinking about leaving Spotify. And we're like, wait a second. And we started to share it. And now all of a sudden, like, I don't get how some of these things work. Um, but what I found is being able to lean in and trust and just work from, I don't know, spots of good values and trying to like throw the rocks, these ripples end up coming out in some pretty amazing ways. Yeah. So the, the positive impact, the positive ripples from radical generosity and just being good. Right. Um, I love that. It's great. Same. This was, uh, this is fantastic. And you mentioned the book coming out in two weeks here. Where can our listeners find the book and where the, can they learn more about your work, Joshua? Yeah, so so two weeks. Are we are we live or are we when 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 are you listening to this? No. So it's coming out on the twenty eighth of November. Uh so depending on when you're listening to this, it might already be released and <laughs> yep. might already have all of these great uh reviews on it. But Joshua, what's the what's the uh what's the schedule here? Yep. So uh it'll be live November twenty eighth, uh ebook version, hardcover version. Uh, audiobook is recorded and should be out there. It may be ready at launch date. They haven't given us the official timelines from Audible. Uh, but it can. Uh, you can go to the main book website, which is daretobenaive.com, and then you can find it at almost all of the uh, normal places you'd look at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, Books A Million. You can go uh, Target, et cetera, all of those ones. And... Um, Knock on wood, a publisher said that hopefully January and February, you'll see it in almost all the major airports at the Hudson Booksellers as well. So that'll be an exciting thing to be able to see it out in the wild. Yeah, it's going to be fun taking that first flight, walking by and seeing your book on a shelf, right? It's going to be really cool. Well. Yeah. It's amazing. 
And then when people listen to this and when people read your book and are inspired and want to talk to you um, about how they can inject this more into their businesses and their personal lives, how do they get in touch with you and Econic to, to do something like that? Yeah, I think one of the first things would be go to the book website and you could find uh, a couple of worksheets on there that are free downloads. Um, there's also kind of a book club guide that will be posted up there soon so that people could take and, and do some you know, introspective book studies with their teams. Uh, if they have any interest in exploring other opportunities or uh, I've been actively out on the keynote uh, circuit heading up to Portland here in a couple of days for a talk, you can use the book at Econic, or I'm sorry, book at econic.co um, and there's contact information that's on the, the website is probably the best way to do that. Also, I don't mind people having my personal email too. Uh, that's joshua at econic.co, again, .co. Awesome. Cool. Uh, any final words of wisdom for, for the audience before we wrap up here, Joshua? If, if anything is stirring inside of you, some sort of dream you still have or regret that you're holding on to if you haven't done it yet, uh, to know that it's not too late, right? It is, it is not too late for you to choose and own your agency or reclaim your agency to be able to make a different decision today. And, uh, you know, the world needs more people who have come more fully alive. And that comes first from understanding what it is and how you're living. And so, um, uh, and even if that sounds a little bit naive, well then I, I guess I dare you to go do that. I love it. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, Joshua. I really appreciate it. This was amazing. Thank you. Thanks Dale. Yeah. Patrick. Cheers. Thanks Joshua.